Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is week 9, day 4 of our study of Luke. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Luke 22, 24 through 46. Well, welcome back to the 10-week Bible study. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and if you've been blessed by this podcast, I'd like to encourage you to leave a review of your podcast app of choice. It helps other people find out about the 10-week Bible study, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God and with His Word. And, and leaving reviews and leaving comments really helps other people find out about this. All right, with that, let's go ahead and pray before we start today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us. God, speak to us. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's go ahead and jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Luke 22, starting in verse 24. A dispute arose among them as to which would be considered the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves." You are those who have stood, I actually want to pause right there. So Jesus is is saying something earth shattering here, absolutely earth shattering. When you look at at just all of the world religions, just as at, at, at every notion of our humanity, what people do, what's normal, what's what's human nature, what Jesus is saying here goes against every bit of it, every single bit. There arguing amongst themselves, right? They, they, Jesus has given them the impression that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they are still thinking, and again, I, I've said this many times, that when Jewish people say, you know, that Jesus is going to come and he's going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and he's going to rule there and there's going to be a throne and all this kind of stuff, they're not wrong. They were never wrong about any of this. What they thought the Messiah to be, they were never wrong. And I've, I've heard it many times that, uh, Christians and pastors and teachers will say, well, the Jews were wrong about, you know, Jesus being this Messiah. He was there to save them from their sins. Uh, Jesus did come to save us from our sins, but they weren't wrong that the Messiah would be this warrior king who's going to sit on the throne of, of his, his ancestor or his forefather, David, and, and, and all of these things. They were absolutely right about all of that. What the problem was, was that they didn't understand that there would be two advents of the same Messiah. The prophecy of weeks in in the book of Daniel makes this very clear. Um, But most of the prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah were about him coming and he's going to like take over and subjugate the earth under the rulership of the throne in Jerusalem. And so this is what they're looking forward to. They weren't wrong about that. Jesus is coming back and that's exactly what he's going to do. What they were wrong about was the timing. They thought that that was what was going to happen. That's what was coming right then and there. That's not what was going to happen. The Messiah was there to lay down his life willingly as a servant for the lost, even for the Gentiles that were going to come in. All of these things are in the Old Testament. They are fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy. But they seem to be the more obscure of the Old Testament prophecy. So even right before Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples still aren't understanding it. They're talking about this immediate coming of the kingdom of God and who is going to be greatest in this new kingdom. And I imagine, you know, James and John and Peter are like, well, he likes us best. He took us up to the Mount of, oh yeah, we weren't supposed to tell you about that until after Jesus. Uh, well, hold on, we'll come back to you on that. You know, it's like, but he took us here and, and he did this with me. And so they're they're all jockeying for this position saying, you know, that they're his favorite or they're going to be the one that God is going to anoint and exalt, you know, in in this in the courts of this, this coming soon to be kingdom. Jesus hears this and he shuts him down. He says, no, 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 this is not how this works. Actually, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you become least. And and this has given rise to a lot of people coining the term servant leadership. And one of the things that I want to point out to you here is that Jesus is not talking about leading through service. 
I want to say that I, I think the idea, the concept of servant leadership, it does have its genesis here in, in this passage and other passages like this in Scripture. And I think there's something to the idea of servant leadership. But as far as believers, it's very difficult when, when you're talking about trying to exist in this world of servant leadership. It's actually very challenging to think of yourself as a servant leader. <laughs> Paul actually breaks it out in, um, I believe, in 1 Corinthians, uh, that he, or it could have been Romans, where he says, you know, if, if, the guy, if God has called you to leadership, then do it with diligence. Do it with diligence. And so there's, there's a difference, I think, between servant leadership and actually being called to leadership and doing that with that diligence. What I see a lot of times, and again, the concept of servant leadership from this passage, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, but generally what you see is people who want to be greater than others and lord over others their authority in whatever place, but then they call themselves servants to make them sound more humble than they actually are. And what you end up with is neither servanthood or leadership. Now, again, the concept is a good concept, but in practice, I feel like I rarely see it. I see people who want to be leaders, calling themselves servant leader, leaders, not doing a lot of service, doing a lot of leadership, doing a lot of asking other people to uh, you know, uh, acknowledge their authority, but not a lot of, of servanthood. And Jesus is saying, do the opposite of all of that. Do the opposite of human nature and actually go and serve. He's not even talking about trying to lead here. This has nothing to do with leadership. He is talking about serving and serving only. He's saying, you know, who at the table is greater? The one who's there is the honored guest, the one who's hosting the banquet or the servant. And he's like, obviously it's the serve or it's the, it's the guy hosting the banquet. The servant's just getting paid. He's just there. But Jesus says, I came to you as that servant. That's the key here. You do that. So even though this is the passage and passages like this in the Gospels, what people use to, to talk about servant leadership, because, I mean, the apostles do end up with the authority and, and the leadership in charge of the church, but they use this as saying, well, we should be servant leaders, and Jesus says nothing, nothing about leadership. In fact, he's like, put that out of your minds. Put how that's going to work. Put the whole leadership Who's going to be first in the kingdom? Who's going to be second? Get that out of your head and become a servant. Continuing on. Verse 28, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That is huge. That is huge. Jesus this is one of the things that blows me away beyond anything else in scripture is that we are sinners. We don't deserve to even be in the kingdom of God, let alone have leadership in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, put the leadership out of your mind, be a servant. And because you have stood with me in my trials, because you serve, I will actually give you authority in this kingdom. And he's like, it's actually a lot better than what you were thinking. You're not going to have to be jockeying for position. He says, you're actually going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Like you are going to judge the people who, who, I mean, these apostles, these disciples, they had no authority in Israel. They had nothing. They were tax collectors and fishermen. These guys are nobodies. And Jesus is saying, actually, I'm going to put you in charge of everything. I'm going to put you 12 in charge of everything. So it's like, don't even think about who's going to be the greatest because you don't even understand what greatness is and you have no idea how good this is going to be for you and everyone else. Like, Don't worry about that right now. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, uh, sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. <laughs> Jesus, the, the, the key point there is when you have turned back. One of the things that I've always read this, you know, Jesus says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. I'd be like, uh, Jesus, how about you just tell him no? <laughs> Why not? Let's try that. Maybe if, if Satan is asking you if, if he can sift me like wheat, maybe next time just tell him no, don't pray for me. 
But this is an important thing here. I mean, I'm I'm being kind of I'm I'm being silly about that. I'm kidding. But I mean, in the end, Jesus is is saying, listen, I'm praying for you. There are times where we have to go through temptation, we have to overcome. We have to overcome that temptation. And and for Peter, it's going to be important for him to go through that temptation and then overcome when he turns back. Strengthen his brothers. This is so important. Because it's not a righteous person is not defined as someone who never sins. That person doesn't exist except for Jesus, who we're reading about here. A righteous person, as defined in the Bible, is the person who stumbles and falls and sins and gets back up every single time. And that's who Peter is. We're going to see the difference here in these passages between Peter and Judas. Verse 33. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered him, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now that you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciple said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. This is such an odd statement, right? He sent them out without money. He told them not to take weapons or anything like that. The Lord would just protect them and take care of them. And now he's saying like, take them, take money, take a purse, take a sword, protect yourself, which is going to be very strange because when Peter here shortly pulls the sword out to protect them, Jesus is going to rebuke him for it. So this all of this, what Jesus is saying here, these passages, there's a, a world of confusion in here. And this is an Im, Im, important thing as life as a Christian. And I like to call it, you know, life in the spirit. Other people call it life in the spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit now. And one of the things that's important for us to do, because these things seem contradictory. Jesus himself is saying, I'm, I'm basically contradicting myself. I told you not to take a purse before, not to take money, not to take a coat, um, not to take a sword. Now I'm telling you, take all of those things. And so understanding the time that you're in is important. And we can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not that Jesus is contradicting himself. It's that there's two different times that the disciples are walking into. And Jesus is warning them to understand those times. The same for us. It doesn't mean that we should never protect ourselves. And it also doesn't mean that there's times where we shouldn't try and protect ourselves, that we should lay our lives down for other people, you know, figurative, figuratively or even literally. Those can both be true at different times in different seasons. And so when we're reading through scripture, a lot of people want to look at these things as black and white. Well, Jesus says you should have a sword and that's why we should have guns. Or Jesus says, don't take, you know, weapons or clothes or money and all that kind of stuff. And that's why we shouldn't have guns. Or we shouldn't have this or that. And really, Jesus says things that could be used to justify both positions. The important thing is, do you know the time that you're living in? Are you being led and guided by the Holy Spirit to understand how to apply those things in your life for that season? I uh, heard some stories by uh, some people in China long ago, and uh, there were Chinese Christians, and they, they were, of course, being oppressed by the Chinese government. And uh, there was a person teaching them, asking them, if the, if the cops come for you, if the authorities come for you, should you run? Should you run? And, some, and, he, and they're like, well, we don't know. And he's like, well, go to the scripture and find out. So they went to the scripture, and some of them came back and he said, you know, search the scriptures and come back with your answers next week. They met a week later and they came back and he said, what did you find out? And one person said, well, you know, I saw where Jesus, you know, he turned the other cheek. And when they arrested him, he didn't run. He didn't fight when they arrested him. And, and he, he didn't fight back and he didn't speak. And so he didn't speak in his name. And then the guy said, okay, that's good. And then another person said, well, you know, I found where David fled from Absalom and ran and all this, and then Paul ran and there's all these people running and they, they had this debate going back and forth. And so the guy finally said, well, which one is it? Which one is it? Do when the, when the authorities come for you, if you're in a church service, this is again, these Chinese believers in the underground church, when the, when the authorities come for you, do you run or do you stay and trust the Lord? And they said, we don't know. 
The Bible says both. And he says, that's right. It says both. You have to understand which is the right thing to do for your situation and your time. And you can only know that by having this cultivated relationship with the Holy Spirit. You have to know in that moment what's the right thing to do. And you have to be uh, have a, a living and breathing and active relationship with God and the Holy Spirit through prayer and through study of his word, through reading of his word. And that's the same thing here. We can't use what Jesus is saying to justify one position or the other. We have to know what is the right season and what is the right time for us to understand when to use these different things. Verse 39, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I find this amazing. In all the times, you know, there's the time where Jesus is fasting and, you know, uh, Satan comes against him and says, hey, you know, why don't you call down your, your angels from heaven so that, you know, nothing will happen to you. And Jesus actually rebukes him. Um, we do know that angels attended to him after the fast and a- an angel comes to him again. Imagine, I mean, this angels are, are created beings just like you and I. I, I want to meet this angel someday in eternity. I want to know who this angel was that got the call to go and strengthen Jesus in this hour of greatest need. This is such an amazing high honor. That whoever this angel was, this was had to have been the most honored of all, uh, you know, tasks ever given to an angel was to go down and strengthen Jesus in this moment. I think that is so cool. Much has been made through the years. Lots of people have commented on the the you know sweating drops of blood. People have made some medical cases for how this can happen when you're under great stress and things like that. So I don't want to go into that. The, the problem with this is, and, and the, the way the NIV is rendering it here is a little bit different than other, other translations may, but basically it's saying that, uh, and it's what was like drops of, of blood. Um, we don't really know what that means. And so beyond just taking it at face value that maybe this is kind of a, a metaphor for what the, the sweat was, that it was, it was so intense that it was like he was bleeding, or maybe he actually was bleeding uh, blood through his, his sweat. It, it's not really clear. Uh, but the, the point is, is that this was great anguish. There was great agony going on here. And Jesus is very troubled by what he's about to have to go through. All right, verse 45. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Here's a key. Prayer keeps us from temptation. I want to say this as proverbial in nature, meaning that it's not necessarily a command and it's not necessarily 100%, but Proverbs are mostly true most of the time. And when we pray, it is much harder to fall into temptation. Much harder. I think this is an important thing to keep in mind. When we pray, when we cultivate a life of prayer, it makes it so much harder to fall into temptation. So in addition to reading God's word and getting it locked away inside your heart. Don't neglect prayer. Don't neglect neglect spending time fellowshipping and communing with the Holy Spirit. For the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time.